My name is Hisham Samawi, and I'm one of the uh, two founding directors of IM Gallery. It's a pleasure to have you all here tonight. Uh, you know, this is our first gallery we've opened outside of uh, the Middle East, and we're really happy to be here. And when we were deciding on who the first artist to be to open the, the new space, it was an obvious choice to to, to give it over to Nadim. Um, his work just kind of transcends all borders. You know, trying to represent art coming from our region, we thought Nadim has the voice to really set the tone for, for our program here. As you can see from the work around you, he's got an amazing sense of humor, able to tackle very tough subjects that we all deal with, but present it in a way, in a, in a really beautiful and inspiring way. Um, another thing about Nadim is his, you know, public artworks are always so, so inspiring as well. You know, we always have a joke whenever, you know, we're talking to people. I always, you know, run through his slides and, and show his various projects that you're going to see, see today. And every time I show it to people, the sense of pride I take in, in being able to show off his work uh, is, is, is great. And uh, you guys are all in for a treat tonight. And not just because we have one great architectural mind here, but we actually have two great architectural minds here today. Uh, we're, we're, very, uh, we're very honored here to have Evan Heathcote from the Financial Times. And uh, you guys are in for a real treat tonight, a great discussion. And uh, enough from me, but let me uh, pass it over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I think I would like to say first that uh, I'm very glad that there is a platform, a Middle Eastern platform that's opening now in London, because it can give a voice which is different, can voice a different aspect of what we usually hear in the media. And uh, this is starting with my work here. There are other places in London opening also, and uh, it will come with the different artists coming. You would see that they voice different ways of dealing with the Middle East, uh, because I feel the media doesn't project really what we are. Now, uh, I also am very pleased to be with Edwin, with whom we are going to open a debate. I just met Edwin recently and I felt that we had like a discussion that uh, like if I've met him for a long time. Uh, talking about the, the title is Can Cities Dream? I think this pertinent title at this moment of what's happening in our region, the Middle East, is very important. <clears throat> because, you know, there's no, I mean, people there dream of dreaming. They don't have even the chance to dream. So they, in their mind, it's something that they're looking forward for it. And uh, if we look at the region, the Middle East, we have different zones coming in, in which revolutions are coming around, but at the same time, they are partly devastated partly booming. So we are in a mindset where if something is built today, it can be destroyed tomorrow. And the other way around, if something was destroyed yesterday, you can build it completely new today. So in this set of mind where uncertainty is the measure to follow in the Middle East, there is a way to be flexible, malleable and to adapt to situations where everything somehow is possible. So from that point of view, I think the creative minds of the Middle East are moving, where we see in front of us cities getting up and falling down, I mean, becoming and uh, vanishing. And this also applies to a special case, which is Beirut in this case, where I can see, I can tell you that there are two anomalies, which are Solider and Dahye, Strange enough, during the civil war, the area of what is Solidaire now, around this is the Mediterranean Sea, uh, is now a glamorous, glamorous area, with luxurious area, where lots of the marina has opened there, the yachts, life is very interesting now, but then during those days, the civil war days, all of this area was demarcation lines, fightings, uh, killing, uh, the same happened in Dahi, which is another area of Beirut, where you see that in one month, a whole area got destroyed completely during the 2006, which is the Israeli-Hezbollah uh, war 
and uh, the Israeli has destroyed all this area during this period. So, and these were and are being reconstructed. So you would see those things happening, like rewinding a city in my mind. So everything happens again. And during that period, uh, I flew with my family. We had to become refugees somehow. So I left and, you know, you can't take much with you. So you take your sketchbook and leave and see a little bit and draw what you would feel that uh, remains, what you see on TV also, like other we were watching TV and just wondering. When will this finish and how will it finish? So in here you see this is the Solidar area with the glamour around, the yachts, everything. And in that same zone, when Hariri died, the Prime Minister of Lebanon, after that, in commemoration, about a million people were on that central place, which is called Place de Martyr in Beirut, but also a year later, there were the tent of Hezbollah in protest against what the government is doing. So you can see the flexibility in our mind comes from that diversity of what you can see in the same zone. And this gives us a way to deal with things. So one aspect which is also frightening in Lebanon, you know Beirut is a city very joyful, very dynamic, where you restaurants that open there, pubs, nightlife, everything is great. But you have this X factor on the side where many of the political assassinations there have been done through explosions and explosions suddenly happen around you. It's a car explosion. It's by remote sensing or by just placing something under the seat of the driver. And that's how many of the prominent uh, politicians in Lebanon have died. But that also means that when you are in your full boom and working, you're, you're working and having the office moving and everything, suddenly everything stops. An explosion means that the whole program of what you're doing will suddenly have to go into rest until people get used to another thing. Now, there is another factor that you could have been there and died at the same time. You could have been partying somewhere and then on the way back something happened. So these are kind of reminders that nothing has been solved yet and then, but still we live a joyful life there, I can tell you. I don't know how to explain it. There is a contradiction, but it's true. And uh, these are photos I've taken of rubble after the uh, Israeli bombardment of the Dahye area. But you know, in our region of the world, we have at the same time other things happening. In the Gulf region, while areas are being destroyed, others are dreaming and creating some of the most important and highest towers in the world, biggest cities in the world. Even Sheikh Mohammed bin Maktoum has announced recently another new city in Dubai, which is even bigger and wider than whatever we have seen until now. But unfortunately, around us <coughs> and very near to us in Syria, there are explosions and devastation happening all around us. Over 800,000 refugees now in Homs and, uh, uh, and Halab, and even Damascus is being destroyed. Just to tell you, two years ago, a little bit more, I would think, there were Damascus, you could not miss Damascus if you wanted to go to the Middle East because the boutique hotel, everything was fantastic. So this amalgamation of things is a crazy thing in our region of the world. The same goes for the souks. I mean, these are, this is a recent photo of souks which reminds me of 25 years ago, the souks of Beirut, how they were destroyed. Now, when we are in such a condition, when there is somewhere parallel to us terror, what more do we want than hope? I mean, that's the main point you would think of. I mean, beyond the embellishment of our piazzas and our cities, we just want this tiny thing of hope, a moment of dream that probably, if we can create, would add a lot in parallel and in compensation to the terror that's happening around us. And this terror is not something that I experience only in the Middle East. I experience it in almost every Western airport in the region, where even water is something frightening. And carrying a bottle of water, they take it from you. So it's something that's happening everywhere from airports to the region to everything. 
Now, in compensation for that, I think, and I have said, and I've asked the question, can cities dream? Now, I think they can dream, and in my vision of things, the specificity, it's very important to have, to know the area where you're creating something. I have, I've gone through public art in a sense to be able to give this hope to the streets, to the piazzas, to whatever is around us. And uh, I feel that the specificity is very important. You have to know the culture where you're putting your work. You have to adapt to the context. And all these things, I can take them from whatever is around us. And we have to be within the spirit of our times. Now, the use of public art, I feel that in one way or another, we have to offer flowers to the city. <coughs> flowers of different ways that would apply to places. At the end, it's a bouquet of flower that you give to the city. A bouquet of flower, uh, it's not really flower as such as a metaphor of flowers. Uh, it's creating project based on stories, based on uh, that could be interpreted differently by the people that are around us and uh, that's another important factor and for that reason I've created a vocabulary made of thousands of characters that would mix in one way or another and the main idea is to be able to fragment the symbol because the symbol in our region could lead to fanatism and the more you can fragment it the better you can get the stories moving and the better it could be interpreted differently by for so many people. So I'm going to show you a few projects that will talk about that. The Beirut project is a project that have moved in the city of Beirut. It began at Musée Sirso where sculpture were moving all around on the top of buildings and uh, going to the places around so that people can discover, can talk about them and can begin interpret it even when it's absurd. On the contrary, the absurdity that comes with it create another vocabulary to the whole thing. <coughs> At uh, Musée National where I've provided the carrier carrying the National Museum and taking it to the different places uh, in Beirut and uh, it continues to the Solidaire area, I mean to the city centre area where the, what I call the archive procession and became urban toys, it's uh, the vocabulary I use, are moving in the city from one place to another. We were working in parallel to the reconstruction of the city center in a way. So you see those sculptures uh, from one place to another, uh, depending on the program that we had. The only thing is that I had a, I negotiated my way with the city to spend three years moving the sculpture from one place to another and at the end keeping them only in the memory of the people, which I think is very important in that sense. To the stage that at the end we added to those uh, fetishes with lots of colors because you would listen to what the city wants from you and you will add those. And I think there is a social implication to what we do in cities. I mean, people have to understand why you're doing this and why we are providing this project. This used to be followed up by the press to say what happened at each stage. And this is the messenger, which is now, they've taken three and four of the sculpture and put them back on the marina area at the Bien. <coughs> so I'll introduce another project, which is called the Three Flowers of Jichu, it's in Japan. It's a completely different story with a completely different context. There is a monk called Jichu who seemed to be coming from the Middle East. I mean, the monks there said there's no way that we built something like this. This, is, this temple is called Nigatsudo. And uh, I thought in commemoration of the 1,250 years of uh, celebrating the existence of Jichu to create a project that will be based on these things. And it seems that the torches, the, the, there is a performance called Omisutori. It's just a dance between fire and water that happens in the, inside the temple around 2, 3 in the morning. And uh, this is a kind of very specific performance. And here we can see that the torches used are different from what the Japanese use. So I thought from those I would create three flowers three giant flowers and propose them on the slopes of the temple. Uh, I think you worked on this model, if I remember. <coughs> and uh, 
Now the monks said that it would be difficult to do something there because of the foundation. 50 centimeters down, there are the ashes of the temple that burned 200 years ago. So they proposed to us a different location where they said, why don't you take this lake? So the idea was to put about hundreds of sculptures in the water and I found uh, it very interesting, especially that behind us is the biggest Buddhist structure in the world with the biggest Buddha inside it. And that's how the project got created after 20 years of negotiations with the monks, where you have those hundreds of sculptures in the water in celebration of this. But this, like the implication of this is a seminar on religion and art. And at the same time, there was a seminar on re-looking at the life of Jichu as such. So this has created other aspects of what could be done from and what public art can create in the minds of people and hopefully make them dream, I mean, through the scenery that you would see. And the lake that's there is called Kagami Lake. Kagami means mirror. So everything you project there looks double. And that helped the project. So we had a double budget for a short thing. So <laughs> it's helpful in that sense. Now I'll take you through the another realized project. So I'm showing you three different projects to tell you that stories are different and the specificity of the place counts a lot in this. In Melbourne, there is a bridge called the Sandridge Bridge, which is diagonal, as you see it, because the train used to come and goes, the, the migrants, the immigrants, used to come from the port and go to the station, the Flinders station, but they created diagonal because the train is the only way for the train to be able to go to the station, which you will see in that case. Now, this project became derelict when the city decided to cut the rail on both sides and keep the bridge as such because of the, pro the existence of airports and everything else, they did not need any more this. So what happened is that instead of coming from the port, suddenly all this area could be used as real estate development, which they have done. And uh, instead of that, they wanted on the bridge to propose something for the Commonwealth Games 2006, especially that the Queen was coming to the opening. And uh, they have asked to build something up to three floors, which I was completely against a building on the bridge, especially because of the diagonal position of the bridge that will interrupt the view on both sides of the Yara River. So I said, why don't we propose sculptures that could be of three floors? and those could move on the bridge and bring back the phases of migration into the city of Melbourne. So they have a kind of social implication for the city in the sense that suddenly they will show how historically everything happened. And uh, this was adopted and we had to study the structures of the sculptures with Arab, in fact, in a way that they are 70% transparent because they are moving on the bridge and they're rotating on the bridge. And this is the project where you have the sculptures on one side of the bridge, and then you can see two of them into movement that are moving on the bridge. I call it the urban clock of Melbourne because morning, noon, and night, it can tell you breakfast, lunch, and dinner when it happens because they move on the bridge. It takes them 15 to 20 minutes to move. They stay there for a short time and then they come back. And here you see them all together when they are all together. But for the Aboriginal, would we stay on the bridge because it, they, have, they were born there. And here you can see different aspects of those sculptures. And uh, here they're going back, all of them, to the Flinders Station. It's called the Travelers. Now there is the idea of the Maremito I would like to tell you about, which is a stranger from afar. So when I met Isosaki once to show him one of the projects, he said, uh, which is a big project, the Prague project, which is not here. Uh, he said, look, you might be able to realize it because you're a kind of Maribito, which I did not know the meaning of the word at the time. And Maribito would mean the person who travels from one place to another is able to give what he has because he doesn't necessarily know the laws and the regulation of the place and moves to another place. As long as he always moves, the city would, under, would listen to him. If he stays, then he's back into the rules of the place. So it was an interesting analysis of how, a uh, way of thinking of how things could be. Now, the Wheels of Chicago is a project I'm trying to make for the city 
of Chicago. So I show you one project that is on the way in the growth of it, and uh, it's on the Michigan Lake. And there is the Navy Piers, which is and in 2016 they have the centennial of the Navy Pier, uh, and they are investing about 200,000, 200 million dollars in that place. On one side of it, there are you find the five circles. So as long as they're creating commercial activities, on the other side, you have, uh, I thought we can create a cultural identity. And we proposed a project which is called the Wheels of Chicago, where we will be putting wheels on those fountains, of the size of those fountains. And the idea came also from Ferris Wheel. So Mr. Ferris has created a wheel during the Chicago uh, International Fair. And Chicago is known as being a city of architecture and art and public art a lot. So we thought on the periphery of that area, it would be nice to have from the high-rise building be able to see those wheels. And we have created zones within Chicago, divided them into six, seven zones. And in each of the zones was dedicated to a different aspect of Chicago, like art, industry, business. So here we have the wheel of diversity, <clears throat> followed by the wheel of leisure. So it's educational in the sense that it connects to the city of Chicago and it creates stories and encounters for the city. So we have different wheels that would reflect different aspects of different sizes, the sizes being imposed by the fountains themselves in the city. So, and the encounter of those wheels, when they mix together, they give you even other stories that would, uh, came, especially people walking on the shores of uh, the Michigan Lake. So here you see them from the top of buildings and something. <clears throat> and I think I'll end this project with the cloud of Dubai, especially that we have a sculpture there about this. The cloud of Dubai is, of course, a project that was requested from me when I was uh, on the board of design board of Dubai and uh, they asked us to do something and I thought that it would be nice to have something which is an antithesis to what is happening with the high-rise building there that are very private and very exclusive to create a public platform which is not the highest nor the lowest and in that sense the project was born is to be able to go up to a place where you can escape the city and at the same time uh, be able to look at the whole thing from a public platform in which there'll be lakes, there'll be a kind of uh, a small park, pavilions, etc. And that will make the city itself dream in a sense, I mean. So if you look at it from down, you'll see, you'll discover the cloud in a different aspect. And uh, if you're down, it's a reflective area. So this gives a new way of looking at the city from and is able to create a public presence. And from there, although this project stayed uh, as an utopian project, it gave ideas for many other works of which we have some here. So this is the fisherman on the cloud fishing high-rise buildings. Uh, so you, I've worked a lot on this uh, on, and I've done several studies of which you have one here behind. And uh, there's the Fisherman and the Cloud, which is at the airport in Beirut. If you happen to be in Beirut, it's in the lounge there. And there is the Cloud, the Fisherman, and the Mutating Cities, which we have a sculpture behind us, where the Fisherman is fishing high-rise buildings of the region. And on the ground, in the sand, you have uh, different museums of Saadiya that are waiting to be fished by the Fisherman. And uh, I think through all of this, it's a journey, and uh, there is navigation, it's go through negotiation, and the most important thing is to make cities dream so that we can enrich them. And uh, there are several projects in the pipeline, and uh, I think that's, that's basically what I wanted to show you. Thank you. Thanks very much for the uh, illuminating talk. Thanks. I can't help but ask the first question, the title of the talk. So you mentioned dreaming cities and art that helps cities to dream, but my question is, and it's a very wide question, can cities dream? 
and I mean the whole purpose of what I do is to go with the idea that yes, they can dream. Not only that, I think it should have been asked in a different way. How do we make cities dream? Because I think cities need to dream. It's not can they dream, it's how, how, do, they, how do we make them dream? It's like it, us, if we end up without dreaming, where can we reach? How far can we go? What's the hope we can reach? So the idea of letting the city itself dream is a very important subject. We can make them dream in different ways. And one aspect of them is to be able to invest and inject public art or art that belongs to the city somehow. It was very interesting to see the way you started with a series of Middle Eastern cities and the, and the conditions of these Middle Eastern cities, which are so radically different and in flux. Damascus from a luxury place to a, to a, a site of civil war, um, right. uh, Aleppo and its history, and then suddenly the, 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 the trauma that is going through at the moment, and then Dubai and its own kind of urban trauma, um, which is a, you know, it's a place bred by maybe the wrong kind of dreams sometimes. Uh, you know, certainly they see the dreams, but you, you, you question the motives of the dreams sometimes, perhaps. But this <coughs> peculiar moment we're going through in, in Middle Eastern history with the Arab Spring and, uh, and, the, and the boom and bust economies of the Gulf, is there a sense in which the, the protests, the, the gathering you showed of the commemoration for uh, Hariri, um, the, the, the occupation in, in Dahlia Square, and these events, these mass public events, which which can catalyze real political change. Is there a sense in which they, they themselves become a kind of art? They become a kind of art event in the way that in 68 in Paris, uh, the événement, the, 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 the events and the protests became a kind of situationist art event? I think, yeah, it's true. I mean, and especially when, for example, I experienced personally, and I was part of it, of this, uh, uh, manifestation that happens in those places and being part of them, uh, you see the whole space completely transformed by the people. Yeah. And you're getting hundreds of thousands of people in one place, mm. turns it into something different. Uh, logically, I mean the sound, everything around you becomes a different thing and it boosts you somehow in a way or another, you know, it's important. And uh, I think it has been happening all over the area, all over the Middle East. And this is what I try to say that those spaces, when they suddenly get empty again, they have to be refilled with something. They right. have to, you, you know, it, it's, it's a kind of you feel that, for me, they create more of the mindset of the adaptation, I mean, of, of the flexibility that mm -hmm. comes through them. Mm -hmm. But also they are a source of uncertainty in our region because when it goes away, what comes to replace this is something that is always a question. So those moments of intensity leave a, leave a hole? Very much, very much. Those moments are very, very strong and they do reoccur a lot now in the region. Yeah. In, in that. I, was, I was talking to an architect uh, last year, an Egyptian architect, who said that he, um, in Tahrir Square, in that huge mass of people, uh, some youngsters set up a, a lost property uh, office because people were losing their mobile phones and their coats and their blankets and, whatever. and it's the first one in Egypt <laughs> and in a way these kind of these spontaneous and seemingly yeah. disorganized things can become a, a site of organization you know more not just political protest the organization of political protest but of a kind of new sense of urbanity which maybe was lacking yeah. I mean even I showed one slide about tents being in the yeah. center of Beirut yeah where you know everything around you is uh, real estate of a very high value yeah. and suddenly you had for several months all these tents that were just staying there and you couldn't even of course come near to them or move them to another place. It had to be resolved step by step. But I still use all of these things not necessarily for the creative mind that we can go through them as much as for the way because mm. they create for us a way to believe that we can go further anyway. You know, it's, it's a kind of, okay, these things are happening in Beirut, they're happening in the whole region. 
anything can happen in our region. You know, I mean, everything, anything can, you would feel this place is fantastic. I'm going, I also last week, I was giving a talk in Beirut, and then this woman said that she moved her atelier and everything from Beirut to Damascus two years ago, because she felt that's the, that's the place where you can do anything and everything is safe. It's the safest place in the region. Just to find out two or three weeks after yeah. that she's done the wrong thing. I mean, it's the only place where you can't be now. Yeah. And she has to move back everything. So there is this adaptation, I would call it, that you have to accept whatever happens. But not only that, it opens your mind to so many horizons, yeah. I think. You also talked in the same vein about car bombs and about the, about yeah. the background state of terror that exists in along the Middle East and I think we should throw dream bombs. Cities. Dream bombs? Yeah, I mean, it's time to throw dream bombs. Well, that, that's, that's part, that's what, what my question was going to be, which is that there is this background noise of, of, of terror. Can art appear a little, a little impotent against this, this constant urban anxiety? Or perhaps, because you also mentioned in your talk, that you managed to enjoy life. Maybe, yeah. maybe that consciousness of death and danger actually heightens the importance of uh, the cultural moment. You know, probably. I, I kind of feel that a terrorist, when he wants to plant a bomb somewhere, needs a process to be able to reach a place and plant it there. A, a public art artist or something needs to go through a parallel process, which is the same almost. It could take you a year to be able to place a sculpture. It could take you a year to be able to place a bomb. You know, it depends. Yeah. It's a whole projected strategy. Now, what happens is if you project a bomb and place a bomb there, it will ultimately kill somebody. So there is a life which will cease to exist. And that's something extremely important. And that can make news worldwide because it's worth making news worldwide. Now, if you project a sculpture here, it can never make news. It can only add to the progress of what we do. That's why in order to compensate for one bomb, you need hundreds of creative power in the balance of things. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's not something that I have to do. It's something that me, yourself, and all the audience here have to move into this creative power to compensate for the terror that happens. And in that sense, I always feel that it's, it's, the, it's the work of so many together, creative mm -hmm. powers, to be able to give this hope, this dream in, in life. I, mean, right. I don't know. That's I the like, way I look at things. I like the idea of a dream bomb. That's a, that's a great <laughs> idea. In the introduction to your, your book, Urban Toys, Paul Virilio, French uh, intellectual, uh, expresses the idea that architecture has real difficulty in bringing joy to cities, that, <coughs> that pleasure is, um, is was left to the sphere of art. Um, can art do things to city spaces that architecture can't? I mean, as both architects and artists, you're able to, to fill some of those gaps that, that, that the architecture with its commercial, economical, functional imperatives can't. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, I mean, yes it can somehow, and in the sense that, like if you see, look at cities like London or mm -hmm. Paris, which I believe somehow they're museum cities, mm -hmm. so there are cities that, I mean, if you look at this street, there's nothing you can move right or left, from the window to the door handle, yeah. which is it's something that stays the way it is, <clears throat> and the only way to move in those places is to be able, the transient part is the public art, is yeah. the artwork that you can place then move it somewhere else and take it away and things. So these will, in, in a in a day-to-day -day work from nine to five, uh, you need something that changes your routine. Mm -hmm. And the thing that changes your routine, I think, is the provision of fragments of stories within the city, within a certain context, and say, ah, okay, I move, I'm walking here, but ah, there's something I can't understand here. It's different from the logic in which I'm used to look at things, the logic in which I work on a daily basis. Something, a different logic comes that takes you to a certain escape in your life mm -hmm. and makes you wonder for a moment, and that's the moment I always talk about, is this moment of a dream that during the day could take you somewhere else. If this could happen, it's very important in a sense. Mm.
Mm-hmm. So, mm. I mean, in, in the region, like uh, in our region, it's just the other way around, you know. Yeah. So, when here you have museum cities there, it's completely transient. So, probably we need an anchor yeah. in order to give a reference to how our cities are moving. So, the way to look at things becomes in a different right. magnitude. It's, it's very interesting. We, 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 talk, we touched on this yesterday a little in a conversation where the, the situation in, in, in London or Paris or Rome or Amsterdam or Venice is completely circumscribed. You, you, you have an extraordinarily little range in which to work. But sometimes that, that limitation can force creativity in the, in the way that where you, have a, where you have a reducing hold and you blow yeah. through it, the pressure grows. Yeah. And whereas in the Middle East you have this opposite situation of complete freedom. Yeah. And that, it strikes me actually as, as, as a Westerner coming from a museum city that that must be quite difficult to have that freedom. It must be quite daunting actually, certainly for an architect to have a context of complete yeah, freedom true. and chaos. It's true. I think, I think what needs to be reached is a balance yeah. between both. But uh, don't forget that there are so many restrictions in our region of the world as to religious and other factors. And uh, artists of the region have been, I think the strong ones, have been successful to go between the lines of them. Yeah. To be able to say everything, but not to show everything, to yeah. have it behind the scene of what they're showing. And that are the successful artists of the region, yeah. where if you want to talk about different forbidden items, you look at the painting or you look at the sculpture and you see them all there expressed in a different way. Yeah. You know, that's also another way of restriction that uh, opens the mind to the way to take you to a certain strong work, I mean. That's, 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 how I, that's how I see the difference between both your eyes. Yeah, that's very interesting. The, the, the public art in the Middle East traditionally is is associated with, with monuments to the political, whether it's yeah. a Saddam Hussein monument yeah. or, a, or, a, or a kind of, you know, and it has a, it, it's been given a bad name, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, those kind of sculptures, which we have here as well in the West, you know, to, to military leaders and to, and to past presidents, they become invisible, no matter how big they are, they become part of the background and they become yeah. invisible. Your art is, tends to be more kind of pop art. It tends yeah. to come and then it goes again. I'm obviously not entirely, but does that? I think you, you touched on this a little in your talk. But that temporariness gives it a much longer power in the memory that it was suddenly there and then it's gone, rather than something that's there and is allowed to then fade in the background and becomes invisible. Is that right? Yeah, I, th- I think it, this is very important: the temporality of things. And the more, I mean, time goes, and the more the cost of my sculptures and everything becomes bigger, cities are not accepting the temporality of uh-huh. the sculpture. They want it to be there and to stay there. And this happened first in Tokyo. It continued in Melbourne. So in Melbourne, in order to create the temporality, I have required the movement of the sculpture. Mm-hmm. So that at least it looks temporal through the movement of it. And in order to create a movement, we had to lose two sculptures. Mm-hmm. So we have promised two sculptures. 12 sculptures, we ended up with 10 sculptures, but for me the importance was in the movement. And this monuments issue of the Middle East, of course, is, is a terrible thing that I think we have to create the anti-monument in a sense that yeah. we have to fragment the monument and cut it into small pieces <laughs> and put it there in different areas, spread it in an area. And that will create interpretations because a symbol would lead definitely to fanatism, because it's one thing that you understand, that you're obliged to understand the way it has been projected. But when you create different small fragments in a place, then you're open to so many interpretations. At least there is a freedom of choosing what kind of absurdity you want to link all these with. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it makes a different way of looking at it. (coughs) Although (coughs) the cities of the Middle East are not the kind of um, uh, museum cities that you you talked of earlier, there is a kind of, there's an increasing museumification in a different way, that that there's there's a kind of increasing importance to let it be put on cultural buildings to make a place in in, in Doha, in in Abu Dhabi. 
Sabia Island, and there's a, the cities are vying for star architects and for big private collections, cultural quarters, theatres. Do you think that 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 the public sphere is benefiting enough from that explosion of art and the amount they're investing in art and, and, and actually the wealth that surrounds the art world generally. Do you think there's more of that should be trickling down? I mean, it's good to have the buzz around art, I think. Yeah. But, you know, all of this is still in, in a mutation way. Yeah. It's moving in mutation, so it's difficult now to decide the impact of it in the future because it's a phase in transition mm -hmm. and we're kind of watching it and you can criticize or be with it, but I think we should let time, it's, it's a difficult subject, you know, yeah. it's a difficult subject to say yes, it's going to be positive or it's not going, you know, when you import uh, art for billions and just yeah. put it there for other people to look at it, when it's not part of your culture, you say why we don't educate more what's happening around and bring mm -hmm. it so but it's also good I think to see this art from that region so I have no clear idea of what's better because I feel it all in mutation people are trying a lot and and trying is already good it's there right. I think trying is already good creating those things is already good now to the benefits or not is something that you need to wait and see how they will develop that's the that's yeah. for me the main part of it can't judge it uh, just like that. I mean, I don't know about your opinion about that, but uh, it's uh, the scale of it is so extraordinary yeah. that, that yeah, you know, the, the private collections here turned into museums, which then turned into public institutions. So the kind of cabinet of curiosities turns into a, a room, which turns into a gallery, which turns into a museum, and it takes five hundred years until we get to the to yeah. Ten, yeah, ten yeah. modern. But it, it, it's happening in six years or ten years. In, in, in Abu Dhabi, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see that explosion, to see what will happen there, right? I, I, can't, I can't imagine it. <laughs> and personally, the same thing, but it's happening. I mean, yeah. that's what I understand. I mean, the Louvre should be finished in 2016, maybe the Guggenheim in 2018, yeah. and then, you know, these projects yeah. are happening one behind the other. Yeah. And, you know, for example, like, there is Madhaf in Doha. Yeah. There, are, there are exhibitions that I couldn't see here and that are going to Madhav. I yeah. find it practical to be able to go and see that exhibition there. Yeah. Even if it's a different context, I think with time, those places are going to be filled with artists and thinkers from the Middle East. They're beginning with the West and hopefully would move. That's why I say we can't judge now because mm. they will ultimately move into uh, artists and works from that region. Yeah. First, you have to have strong artists in that region. And uh, second, you have to have the administration thinking of bringing those to that. So there are lots of things still to build up for that region. And uh, I think everybody's working on that. I am trying to do so too. I mean, yeah, yeah, as absolutely. part of the whole thing. So just things are trying to build up to create the necessary power in the region to be able to fill in those spaces. But yeah. they're quite big, as you said, yeah, they're huge, yeah, huge places. Finally, I just wanted to ask about the, the, the language, which, which is in your paintings, in your sculptures. The, the contexts are so wildly different. We're in, in Bond Street, but we, we, we could be in Melbourne or in, uh, in, in Beirut or Japan. But a lot of the language is very similar to the language that you use in public sculptures. There are these kind of pictogram type yeah. characters. Do the, do the meanings transform radically depending on their context or actually do pe are people's responses to these things very similar do they provoke very similar responses all around the world you know because at the start of it the story is different mm -hmm. it's based on the specificity of the place then whatever comes after like the figures I always change them I try to change them right. to put different ones like in Nara you have a whole vocabulary different from other places yeah. but the story helps into uh, into the whole thing being accepted by the citizens or the people that are following up what's happening. So although you have the same thing, people identify to, to them because they have been built in the context of the place itself. And it's like if you draw something, you begin drawing something and then you have about a hundred hands beginning taking you around the canvas so that you can't move here and until you understand the way things are happening and then it flows by itself. So. 
this area, this zone where hundreds of other hands came and took you right and left, are the people living in that place. They want something that they can identify with. And then when you understand the whole thing, it just goes smoothly at the end and yeah. it works. It works. And when it works, when, when it happens, it means it works. Yeah. Now, otherwise, it won't happen. That's, that's the difference. I mean, when, when you feel that you impose something on a place, it just doesn't happen. Or even if it happens, it breaks at the end. And why yeah. elephant? Yeah. Yeah, the one in the back here. It's a difficult question. Everybody will ask me this question. You know, I have an affinity for this elephant without. Uh, it's the elephant, the shape of the elephant, and the way I created it allows me to put different things on it, especially that elephants have big memories and they create an aura around them. Like in this one, there is a whole aura around it that gives you all the stories you can imagine of the Middle East. Depends how you interpret them, how you shift, how you go up, down, how... I, I make them in lines, so you have so many tiny different things that will say something. And in our part of the world, stories are very important. As long as you can tell and say, give a story, then you can go beyond the fanatism area, in my case, that's what I think. Now, the elephant also is it's cute. <laughs> I don't know. You look at it, you feel, okay, everybody recognizes it, everybody loves it, and the simplicity of its shapes appeal to everybody in a sense. I mean, because I've done it, the first exhibition at Musée Cerso, there were so many of those sculptures, everybody looked at the elephant. It was my first experience about these things, you know. But also, I know, I know why, because of, and especially, I was talking about temporality, about dream and things. This kind of elephant can fly. It was, it's called the flying elephant. So whenever something extremely heavy can have the appearance of ephemerality and flying, it's also very important in the work I do. I mean, it can have this feeling, okay, uh, it's an elephant that's flying almost, you know? So I can't answer directly this question, okay, but I, I can only talk about it, you I know? I asked the same just, question <laughs> yesterday, and it was, a, it was a different answer, uh, but the, at the end, of it, <laughs> the end of it, you said the elephant is relevant. Yeah. Which I was very... Yeah. <laughs> Is your answer this mainly public? It's mainly public, yeah. yeah, I mean, because I want everybody to experience it. I mean, uh, just to give this moment the possibility for every citizen passing by that place to have a moment of dream. That's, that's the main idea. Now for, like, the works here, if you want, it's just that if by immersing yourself in the thing, you can go beyond it. That's ultimately that's what I would like to reach, and I've used glitter a little bit for that reason, so that when you get into the work, suddenly there are those little points everywhere that try to tell you, okay, I got into the story. How can I get now beyond it? So I think that's something like that. Good. Well, thank you all very much for coming, making it an interesting evening. Thanks for the questions. Thank you so much to the IAM Gallery. And of course, Thanks thank everybody. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.